Okay, so let me go ahead and um, take it from the top right now. So yeah, I'm here at the outline. That's perfect. I can start there. Can you all see me and hear me? If you can see me and hear me, put a Y in the chat. How about that? <laughs> Anybody? Oh, okay, great. I'm seeing the Ys. I'm seeing the Ys. Perfect. Okay, so um, I collected so many fascinating stories about how Black women have navigated, rejected, accepted, um, and even at times manipulated the American dream so that they can experience uplift for themselves. So um, as you know, um, Kamala Harris recently just accepted her nomination as Vice President of the United States. And during her acceptance speech, one of the first things that she talked about was all of the Black women um, throughout history who have made claims to freedom, who have done the work, um, pushed the boundaries of the definition of freedom in this country, and how they did it without their stories being told. But I'm here today to deliver some of the most fascinating stories. So here's just a few examples. Um, so black women defined it the American dream as uplift in the form of social transformation. So one black woman says, I want to be something bigger than myself. My American dream is to be successful. I want to go back to Somalia, build my own school, be my own principal. And my main focus is not to enhance America, but to make Africa better. That is my goal. Another story of the American dream. So um, a lot of black women, and this was the biggest thing that came out, they defined the American dream as an ideology of exclusion. So it's not saying like, oh, here's an ideology to get ahead. It's more so this is an ideology that is used to exclude. So a woman says, I deal with this a lot at work because I have a registration job. Sadly, you see a lot of black men and women doing these jobs. Doctors and nurses treat you bad because they don't even know you until they have a reason to talk to you. If you sort of seem educated and seem like you can hold a conversation, then they're like, oh, well, what do you do? Then I'll say, oh, I actually attend the University of Toledo and I am in pharmacy school or I am uh, trying to be in pharmacy school. And then when I'm around the hospital, then they go to speak. Another definition of American dream, strength. You know, it takes a lot of strength and energy to prove people wrong and not to be a stereotype and to prove you are not one. I am happy that I am strong enough to do it. So um, I just present to you these stories. So um, first off, in order to um, really hone in on how black women define the American dream, I had to set or have in my mind what American what an American dream is because it can be all these things, right? So um, I so the American dream definition that I used in my research was it was a set of ideals and values about how to get ahead in American society obviously is rooted in the Declaration of Independence. It's also rooted in um, uh, the Puritans um, uh, and um, their, essentially their way of life really just kind of set the tone the way we think about the American dream today. Um, I could go on and on and on about this topic and how Black women um, survived and navigated that even while they were enslaved, but uh, <laughs> we'll be here for another hour. Um, and also when we think about the American dream and black people, um, it's usually rooted in Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, um, and also the antithesis of Martin Luther King, I have a dream, is Malcolm X's The American Nightmare. Um, he says, I don't experience the American dream. I am 
the victim of Americanism and I don't experience the American dream, but I experience an American nightmare. Um, and also James Baldwin, um, has the American dream been, um, I, I can't think of the exact <laughs> title, but the American dream as the expense of the American Negro. So what do all of those things have in common? Well, number one, it's like an androcentric approach to the American dream. It's just assuming that all black people have one singular experience. And some people could argue that they do, but also it's like the, um, um, articulation of American dream through the eyes of black men. So narrowing it down further, so um, black feminism um, has um, been of movement for social justice and change. And this um, re body of research is solely situated in black feminism. So um, um, so the black feminist conceptualization of the American dream took place um, during Anna Drew Cooper's speech when, um, and the speech is called Women's Cause is One and Universal. Um, so back in 1893, um, Anna Drew Cooper, um, her dream for black women was the right to grow. Um, so therefore, the definition of this Ameri of the American dream in this particular study was the ability for black women to create their own collegiate paths and to tell their narratives. And I set that as the definition of the dream to essentially allow an opportunity for black women to dream. And I just love this so much. So next slide, please. Thank you so much. Okay, so this is like some really important literature about the American dream. Um, so I can go on and on and on. <laughs> and there are so many other authors that didn't make it here today, but that's totally okay. So Emily Dalgo, like that was pretty much like the most important study. If I had to say like out of all of them, I mean, they're all like super duper important, but Emily Dalgo was the one where I like totally looked at her study and I was just like, this is it. So um, she, her study, and this is like one study out of, I mean, so there's really, I don't want to say like a complete absence of this, but it's very, very, very limited research out there on like academics actually studying it. And she was like pretty much like one of the few ones out there actually studying it. And she found that black women were more skeptical of the dream than black men. And these were um, black college um, students that studied in HBCU. So I thought that was like really, really fascinating. So I said, um, I adapted my research questions from her research questions. Um, Haynes Stewart and Allen. Um, so in the literature review, they just talk about how the American dream is a dominant narrative and is found in the Hain curriculum. And they said that um, the American dream um, can facilitate um, the experience of feeling invisible in the classroom. Toni Morrison. Um, rest in peace, Toni Morrison, but she wrote an article about how um, the American dream is all about this notion of make America white again. Um, so that's the quote that I remember. Um, so um, Patricia Hill Collins and a few others say that Subtima Clark McClark trans transformed the classical indicators of the American dream. So the classical ind indicators are like, hard work, merit, equal opportunity, right? So Subtima so Clark took like the concept of hard work and transformed that into activism. So Audre Lorde said this, says that this is important too, so that the feminist movement needs to transform these harmful ideas and patterns into social change. And also another really important um, piece of literature was Melissa Harris Perry. Um, her book is like another really, really, really important piece to this um, body of research. So she says that the dominant American ideological scripts are imposed on Black women. Therefore, peers um, misrecognize their behaviors and actions. So like what I found in my research is that when Black women were working really, really hard and really like doing what they need to do to be successful in their courses, they were automatically assumed like, oh, you're 
too aggressive. Oh, you're too intense. So, um, so even when they do strive and they do take on and adapt like these classical indicators of what it means to get ahead, it's automatically like, well, you're, you know, there must be something wrong with you. So that leads to this notion of the ideology of exclusion. So um, next slide. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so here are just the three um, research questions. I don't have to read all of them, but I really love question number three. How do their chosen academic paths during college extend notions about American dreams and American dreams deferred? And I will also even argue like the American nightmare. Um, so it's like what happens in between all of that? So how do black women navigate the, the ideology? Next slide. Okay, so using Black feminism um, as a framework to understand what's going on. So I found, so I asked them, how do you define the American dream? And listen to this, these stories, they were like so amazing. Like I cried um, <laughs> when one um, woman was um, talking about her mom. Um, I was shocked at what I heard. I learned so, so, so much. So um, they defined it in five different ways. So the first definition was the American dream means family, self-sufficiency, and avoiding the baby mama stereotype, and which I didn't put up, up in here, but it is like um, underneath um, when I actually go into the definition and the story. Um, it also means the reality of survival, which I thought was like really shocking. Um, definition two, um, they said that the American dream is for someone else. Um, definition three, they said that the American dream excludes black women also, meaning the American dream is an ideology of exclusion um, and not an ideology that means to get ahead for them. Definition four, they said the American dream meant to turn inward. And this one was like truly fascinating and at times really heartbreaking. And as we go on, like I'll show you why. And um, definition five, they said that the American dream means to uplift. Next slide. Thanks so much. And y'all, I can see your comments actually too, or I can see the chat. So if you got um, anything you wanna say, like anything that's like shocking right off the back or any questions or whatever, just put them in the chat. Um, and then I'll, I have absolutely no problem stopping what I'm saying and to elaborate more. So the first definition, um, here are the sub themes. So they wanted to get married, have a family and all that stuff, but they're like, listen, like, please don't stereotype me as like a baby mama that I'm just having kids, you know, all reckless and things like that. So they automatically went into defense of motherhood. And that also says something about black women's sexuality too. So even under the context of like this American dream, like how we get ahead, that stereotype is like, okay, under the lens of the American dream, it's like, well, your dream is that you're sloppy and this, that, and the other. And that totally, you know, aligns with, you know, these black women um, stereotypes that are really harmful about their sex and sexuality, gender, morality, like all of that. So, um, and the reality of survival. So this idea of like, yeah, you know, it's important to, you know, have a good job, but if you're not familiar with how hard America can be, then you're going to sink. And I thought that was like really shocking. And to be self-sufficient. So um, one of the most fascinating things I, I noticed too in this first definition is that like a lot of the participants also said that they wanted to be stay-at-home moms, um, but they also wanted to be economically self-sufficient. So I'm like, how can you be a stay-at-home mom and rely on your husband? So they wanted that life, but at the same time, they're like, I want my own money. I want to stay at home, but I want my own money. So I'm like, huh. So one of the policy or one of the recommendations could be to funnel women 
um, into STEM careers where, you know, their, um, where their schedules is not like a nine to five. Maybe they can work three times out of a week or four days out of a week, or they can like, I know like pharmacists, for instance, um, you can work like one straight week and then you're off like the next week. Um, STEM, also I tell them get a PhD, you know, <laughs> you can make your own office hours, things like that. So um, the first um, story, um, quote, um, and these are all fake names, by the way, these are not their real, real names. So one student said, when I was growing up, I was told the American dream was to have a family, meaning a husband and a wife living together in a substantial home in a safe neighborhood. And I love how she said that is what I was told. Um, Ashley says, I think it's important to emphasize to avoid being the baby mama. Me, as a, a person, I kind of measure success. Um, she says just the stereotypes and stuff. And then what, okay, so what you'll see at the bottom here is like the call and response. So I don't know if anybody's familiar with call and response. So it's rooted in jazz music. Um, and it's also rooted in the black church. So if you ever go to the black church, usually the pastor would say, let the church say amen. And the whole congregation says amen. So I found that to be um, a really cool way to test the validity of their responses. So I just wanted to put that in there. So I'm really, really excited about that. So Sierra says, as a black woman, personally, I just want to be successful. I want my own things. I don't want to ask anybody for anything. I just want to be respected. And then another participant said, true that. So that just goes to show you that they that is the validity of their statement and that, you know, the data is real. <laughs> OK, there's no, no funny business with this data. So, um, yeah. Next slide, please. So the second definition, um, the American dream is for someone else. So Gina says, looking back on when I developed my understanding um, of the American dream, I believe that it was something that a man achieves. Um, Sierra says, I think when you look at history, the American dream is very standard. And this was really shocking like especially if you read the entire transcript she said she says it's like a man a woman there are children a dog a nice house and a car in the driveway the man went to work and the woman was a housewife but now it's not like that anymore because there are so many different family structures for one you have kids and you don't even need a man and it can be two men two women it can be single so it's different so they're talking about here that, you know, the American dream is really for someone else. And not only that, and that it's outdated as well, and that it's not inclusive of other people lives real live realities. And I feel like that's another um, pol or a research um, implication or something you can uh, explore even further. Next slide. Can you go back to three? Or maybe there's a typo in there. Oh. Okay. Okay, so definition definition three, this was the biggest theme out of all of them. Like I just had pages of pages. And then like what I love about focus groups is that when you get the participants really excited, they'll start to say, oh, I remember one this particular time and that particular time. And then that's why black feminism or any really any sort of like feminist methodology is so important, because when you start to tell the stories, it affirms other women in the, in that particular group. And it helps women to know that they're not alone in their experience. And then what was happening in my focus group, they actually started, you know, trading like advice and stuff like that. OK, so this is how you navigate this situation, that situation. So that definitely happened um, uh, 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 a lot 
um, during this this time when they were focusing on how the American dream was an ideology of exclusion. So Katrina says, I want to say people underestimated me. And there were like so many examples of how their peers and their professors underestimated them. They believed that they couldn't do it. And then therefore they had to work twice as hard to prove that they could do it. So going down to the example of um, twice as hard, for one, I'm disabled, two, I'm the only source of income. If I want something, then I have to work to get it. My way of thinking was burned into my skull from day one. Out of this, out in this world, you have to work 10 times harder as a white person. And then finally, Latifa says, a year ago, this white guy, we was sitting, we sit next to each other. We are both slow in math and we were sitting together and I'm like, okay, we about to do this thing. Okay, so that's a classic indicator of the American dream. I'm going to uplift myself. I'm going to work hard and we're about to do this. So the professor, and I believe she made friends with this particular guy. And, and the professor, reading her narrative here, the professor, even though I am raising my hand, she says, and he's raising his hand, he got all the attention. So, um, and that piece talks about the visibility and invisibility that Black women experience in their college classrooms. Um, so even when they did strive to um, gain some pieces of the American dream, um, their professors and their peers ignored them, basically. Or they were hyper visible, um, which was a form of punishment, basically. So I have like tons and tons of examples of this. I'm thinking of like another um, story, but we are at 12.34 p.m. So I don't want to... Um, take up the time but if you have more um questions about visibility and invisibility like please put it in the chat and i'll definitely respond so next slide please okay definition four the fourth definition, um, they believed in turning inward. So that meant like focusing on themselves. So they're like, when stuff got a little bit too deep, they would just turn off their social media for a while. They were just like, you know what? I just need to chill and I just need to gain my strength and I need to be happy within myself. So Erica says, you don't want to be stagnant. Okay, so one thing I want to say here is like this definition definitely fed into the previous definition of feeling excluded because it's like after you have to work twice as hard, you're constantly underestimated, and then you're hyper visible and then you're invisible, it stresses you out or it stresses them out. So this is what they did to cope. So their American dream was to turn inward. So Erica says, you don't have to be stagnant. You want to grow instead not to grow. You want to be stable and not losing. It is knowing. It's evolving as a person. It's new expectations, setting goals. It's being straight. So this, when, when this um, participant said this, I could almost cry because I was thinking about... Um, Anna, Julia, Anna Julia Cooper's Her Dream for Black Women in the late 1800s. And what was it? Do y'all remember? It was the right to grow and to see that progression. And another reason why I love this, because it shows the validity of Black feminism. And a lot of these women, they might not define themselves as feminists, but as you can see, like how they're defining um how they're defining the American dream is inherently like black feminists. So, um, and it falls within that line. So um, Sarah says, and this is the title of my dissertation and this proposal or this um, presentation here. She says, and this is her definition of defining strength. So we were talking, we're on the topic of strength. She says, we wear the obstacles down not the other way around. And that was her definition of strength. And she further says, if you fail a class, take it again, get an A or a B the next shot. Finally, Monica says, the American dream is never, is really never ending. Once you get something, you're going to want more. I think happiness is the dream for me to finally get to this place 
that whatever happens, I will always be happy with myself. And quite a few of them talked about how like the American dream is never, never, never ending. It just keeps going and going and going. And in part because of the materialism that goes into it. Next slide, please. Like materialism and consumption, like the mass consumption. So, um, yeah. Okay, so last but not least, um actually there are really six definitions i only reported five um but i will just say the sixth definition is um parental input a lot of them felt like that their parents had too much to say about their lives um so um and that i thought was really fascinating but it wasn't as strong as the other ones so last but not least again the fifth um definition is uplift um so it meant giving back and particularly to their mothers um to be a role model and to engage in social transformation so faye says my mom and this is the one that made me cry while i was interviewing her my mom is my biggest reward as far as seeing her happiness because she had me at a very young age and the family has always talked bad about her. She had me when she was 17 turning 18. She got called all types of names. It was just everything against her and my grandmother was pretty harsh towards her. And so with my mom, I feel like she is my biggest reward. I'm going to keep pushing until I finish so that I can help my mom and my siblings. Sierra says, and here's like a um, example of a call and response. Um, but I couldn't, I didn't add the response because I didn't want to <laughs> mess up the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the formatting of the quote here or my Canva presentation. Um, so Sierra says, I don't know want nobody. I don't want nobody telling me anything unless you are my mentor. And personally, one of my dreams was to just be a leader on campus. I feel like I did that. And a, a participant said, yes, you are a leader. So again, that validity part. Latifa says, my idea of the American dream is more like Martin Luther King. Again, this was like another tearjerker. She says, a successful, full-on Black revolution that actually creates change, not a temporary status of change. And they all talked about transforming um, the conditions around them and how they plan to do that. And that was a part of their American dream. Next slide. So uh, my committee um, would always say, so what? Now what? Like, why is this important? So I'm just going to summarize um, everything that I found here. So um, this is important. Um, so the Black college women in this study, and their ages range anywhere between um, 18 to 37. So I got a pretty good sample. So they, you know, they desire parts of the American dream, but they also believe that it wasn't for them. Their definitions do represent like this inherent contradiction in U.S. society about um, equality, hard work, and meritocracy. So the really fascinating thing about this is that Black women, especially in 2008, have been... Um, um, labeled as the new model minority. And I don't know if anybody has Googled any, rep any reports, but I do know around the time Obama was elected, they were the, um, their graduation rates and particularly I believe for graduate school was like incredibly high and it overtook like other groups. So it was like, okay, black women are making it. And also black women, um, the last I heard was one of the fastest growing groups of entrepreneurs as well. So, but however, any income inequality still pers persists. 
Yet 80% of black mothers are breadwinners and bring in at least 40% of the household income. So I think that's where that self-sufficiency piece comes in. Like, you know, I want to be married. I want this. I want that. But I have to be, I have to be able to provide for myself. So in addition to the economic um, realities of black women, the reality of survival is compounded with the gross unemployment within their generation. Um, and I think a lot of that to um, the student loan debt is also a huge piece of the reality of, of survival. Um, so what I found was like really fascinating, as I said before, like they defended black motherhood. So notions about independence from men was just a rejection of traditional um, power relations, especially within the dominant American dream context of the family. The American dream notions of motherhood was not seen as an obstacle until it was narrowly defined. So basically, they were fine with the whole motherhood thing, but just don't narrow it down, okay? And once motherhood was narrowed down, then it became an obstacle. Um, so, um, so theme two, American dream is for someone else. So according to their narratives, men and their families um, of black women had the decision-making power, especially where dollars were spent. And I found that to be so super fascinating because we always hear the narrative of black women or black men being endangered. And, and when it comes to police brutality, like that is so important. Like we should pay attention to it. We should have police reform all of that stuff, right? We do need to transform our society regarding that. But again, according to um, the studies and according to what the participants said, the black men in their um, families had a lot of power and the black men around them had a lot of power. The American dream was viewed as something white Americans achieved. In the context of nativism, the American dream is defined based on social political context in which black women, black Americans experience. So they also believe the American dream was too narrow and it was a stereotype of America. That was like another thing that constantly came up in the narratives. And I would have never like dreamed to even think of that, like the American dream as a stereotype of America. The American dream did not reflect the lived experiences of culturally marginal people. So this definitely defines or aligns itself with the research that's out there. Um, so going back, um, they said that this is my dream. Like they were very like, um, a lot of them were just like asking me like, and they were kind of laughing at me and it made me feel a little uncomfortable. And I'm like, what's wrong with my questions? But they were just like, Dr. Pat, why are you asking me this? Or at the time I was Miss Pat. And they were just like, I don't have an American dream. It's my dream. Like it's not, you know, American it's not an American dream. So I think that could align with like this notion of individualism. Um, but they, 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 they believe in individualism to make room for multiple dreams, right? Not for like conformity. Um, so, and the biggest theme, again, participants were um, prescribed and, um, prescribe harmful labels to their academic achievements. Um, participants navigated these labels and, to, and they acted as agents to speak truth to power. A lot of them, they engaged in what Bell Hooks called talking back. Participants experienced a dichotomy of invisibility and visibility, which was imposed on them. Visibility in essence was related to their behavior interpreted by their peers as highlighted in the counter narratives. Um, these findings align with a lot of research out there, visibility and invisibility. Like about that, there was a story where um, there was a young woman, she was in um, an organization and this guy says, I like chocolate. And she's like, oh, I like chocolate too. And then the guy was like, no, not that kind of chocolate. As in, he did not like chocolate people. He did not like black people. So that was like one of the most extreme overt examples of hypervisibility. Um, 
So just move along here. So like to, in order to deal with this, they turn inward and then they just said, I'm just going to focus on myself and I'm just going to uplift others. So they spoke about giving um, their family money and resources, in particular their black mothers. But it is important to know that there have been studies shown that one of the reasons why black um, students can't like enjoy their college degrees and their careers and the money from their careers and to build wealth is because they give their monies to their family. That's one of a I'm, I'm sure a multitude of things as to why, right? In addition to the student loan debt. Um, so they also believe in role models. They value mentorships and being a role model to others. Um, they called it a struggle pass on, which I thought was just like beautiful. Um, and lastly, they believed again in changing the society and transforming the conditions around them. And this aligns with black feminism. I mean, just all of this really aligns with all the black feminist research that's out there. Um, so citing that black women engage in resistance for liberation approaches in which they were called to transform the conditions for themselves and around them. So the last slide just talks about just some problem solving things that we can engage in. So do you all have any questions? We got 10 minutes to discuss. So first off, like, how did you like the findings? Did you all like the findings? Did you learn something? I know like every time like I go through this stuff, I always learn something new. I have different aha moments. Oh, Dr. Carey, so nice. To, I can't see you. Let me, um, uh, I can't see you right now, but I can engage with you on the chat. So excellent presentation. I wonder if any of your participants discussed wanting to get involved in politics or run for office. Um, not that I could recall. Not that I could recall. Um, they were more so like operating like, I don't want to say like the not back channels because they're not back channels, but they were really focused on like their black female networks in order to engage and uplift. And I remember, I recall a particular narrative that said like how this individual wanted to be a leader. And she felt like that she achieved that because um, a lot of her friends and um, other women who were coming up as freshmen would seek her advice. Uh, excellent research. Did the participants mention anything? Um, Dr. Cockrell, yeah, thank you for joining. I'm so excited. And congratulations for your 20 under 40 nomination, by the way. I the fact that I'm nominated with you, like I'm I don't have to win anything. Like I'm good. Like I'm like and on the list with you. So did the participants mention anything about the role of their fathers? Oh man. <sighs> I want to say, um, yes, actually, um, there is um one particular woman. So she's the one that talked about um how she didn't want to stay stagnant and she wanted to keep growing. And I do recall her saying that her father would tell her, you know, to keep growing, to keep striving, to keep, you know, being who you are. So that I think would also be another um, research um, recommendation to sort of explore like the role of fathers, but it wasn't like anything consistent. It was always just like, um, it was always just like, they, they didn't mention their fathers at all. And, but then there is one participant that did talk about her father, but it was just like, oh, he didn't give me anything. It was like, so it was kind of like, it, are we talking about um, men in power or are we talking about like a child that's just disgruntled because they didn't get the kind of car they want or something, you know? So that was something that I did think about and I did explore, but it wasn't like an emerging theme. Um, 
what is U Toledo doing right now when it comes to supporting Black college women? What's the first policy recommendation do you think we should take here at U Toledo? Um, you know, honestly, I'm not really sure, but I do like um the programming that I'm seeing a lot. I know um Dr. Rachel Dudley has been doing like an amazing, amazing job with just getting black feminism out there and especially, you know, when it comes to health. I know the Women of Color Summit is doing really good. Um, me personally, one of the things I do want to see is I want to see intersectionality, and this might be like a faculty thing, but I want to see intersectionality written in like college constitutions and stuff, and even like the university's constitution. Um, I want to see it like all throughout the curriculum. Um, and I also think that um, combining um, the women, the women's center and the multicultural center and just maybe having like a separate center for like research to gather data and to just kind of see, you know, what black women are doing and, um, you know, how they're surviving and thriving at the University of Toledo. So I think that's like one of the amazing things, but I do know like the Women of Color Summit has definitely um, like progressed um, and I do think that they're doing like a really, really great work. So I, I do see like a lot of things that are changing. Okay, Malika. Um, did the participants distinguish between cultural competency and anti-racist training? No, but I think that they would prefer. I mean, just like gathering um, from what I from what I saw in their narratives, they would probably say anti-racist training. They would probably say what is cultural competency like what does that mean it's not like as specific but if we're talking about anti-racist training because they talked about you know um the negative effects of racism and how they essentially how it, how it had a, 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 an impact on them and some of them had to heal from it so um they didn't distinguish between the two but they will probably say anti-racist training for sure um, so anybody else? I'm so happy everyone came to see me. Malika's on. Yes, I'm so happy. Yeah, this was fantastic. Everybody, um, what if, oh, there's an echo there. <laughs> What if we all like unmute ourselves for a minute and do a big clap? But given that I'm the one echoing, that might make quite the noise. Would folks feel comfortable turning on their cameras for a second so we can do some applause for Dr. Oh, Patton? Oh, thank you. Come on. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. This was this was absolutely fantastic. Um, we appreciate you bringing your research to the Everly Center Spotlight, and we're excited to see what's next for you in your research. Actually, what is next? Is this a? Did you say this was a book project, an article? Where are you taking it? Yeah, I'm actually working on a book proposal. I am almost done, but obviously, different publishers want different kind of proposals. <laughs> <laughs> so um I have been working like nonstop on this. Um so I think what I'm going to do though is publish an article. I'm going to publish on theme 3 and then um I'm going to just go ahead and um go for the book because it's really hard to just chop it up and you can chop it up in smaller pieces. You can there's like both ways you can take it, right? But I just feel like with everything that's going on, especially with the vice presidential nominee, and it's so hard to narrow it down. I mean, you can write a whole book alone on just like the Puritan um, experience um, and how black women were situated then and how um, the definitions of like black women's resistance started, started to take form during um, the Puritans and just like, um, um, just uh, seeing how it progressed just from then to now, I mean, it's it's just so much. And it's a huge topic, too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are so many different um, paths that you could take from here. So thank you again. Uh, 
Malika, before she left, put in the chat that the Women of Color Symposium will be on March 26th of this year. It will be held virtually. I'm going to go ahead and say if you want to get involved in the symposium this year, why don't you reach out to Malika? Um, her email address can be found on the Office of Diversity and Inclusion website. You can also email me and I'm happy to connect you. Um, Thanks again, everyone, for showing up. <laughs> we'll go ahead. Yeah, so um, I was going to say, like, so in the beginning, when um, the Women of Color Symposium was taking place, actually, I was like eight months pregnant and I was finishing up my dissertation and <laughs> I was like incredibly busy and I couldn't commit to anything but getting done. So, but now that I'm done, things are a little bit different now. So that is. That is how it goes for sure. Um, okay.